Asato ma sadagamaya Tamso ma jyotirgamaya Matyor ma mritam gamaya Om shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace. Swami Rama's tradition is an unbroken chain of Himalayan sages that is more than 5,000 years old. The tradition was formally established by Shankaracharya 1,200 years ago. The scriptures of this tradition are the Vedas, the oldest spiritual scriptures in the library of humanity. The teachings have been passed on primarily orally each sage transmitting knowledge directly to prepared students. According to this tradition, yoga encompasses all the philosophies and practices that have ever been followed by the great sages, not only of the Himalayas, but also of Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Zen, and Sufism as well. Born in Uttar Pradesh to a learned Brahmin family, Swami Rama was raised from early childhood by his master, a great yogi and saint of Bengal, who lived in the foothills of the Himalayas. He was known as Bengali Baba, or simply Babaji. Babaji was a yogi of immortal wisdom and one of the greatest masters of the Himalayas. From his early childhood, Swamiji practiced the various disciplines of yoga science and philosophy in the traditional monasteries of the Himalayas. From 1938 to 1944, he taught Hindu and Buddhist scriptures in several monasteries. Throughout his childhood and adolescence, he lived and traveled with the saints, yogis, and fakirs of Garhwal, Kumau, the Kangra Valley, Kashmir, Ladakh, and Tibet, with occasional retreats in other parts of India. He studied closely with many spiritual adepts, including Maharshi Raman, Sri Aurobindo, Anandya Mahima, and Rabindranath Jagor. During this period, saints and villagers lovingly addressed him as Bhule Prabhu, or Bhule Baba. When he was 21 years old, Swamiji journeyed to Tibet to his grandmaster to learn certain advanced practices, such as the technique of Bhargaya Pravesh. This is the ability to leave one's body at will, enter someone else's body, and then return to one's body again. He also learned a few methods of solar science, Tantra, and Sri Vidya from his grandmaster. At the young age of 24 years, he became Shankaracharya Karvipitam in South India, succeeding Dr. Kurtkoti to one of the highest spiritual positions in India. He was known as Sadashiv Bharti throughout Central and South India. During this term, he had a tremendous impact on the spiritual customs of that time. He disposed with useless formalities and rituals, made it possible for all segments of society to worship in the temples, and encouraged the instruction of women in meditation. He renounced the dignity and prestige of this high office in 1952 to return to the Himalayas to intensify his meditative practices in the monasteries. In Swamiji's tradition, it is required that the students spend a certain amount of time in isolation in a cave. He lived for 11 months in a very small cave without seeing another person or coming out of the cave. Food was left outside the cave 
and cleansing the body was done through vigorous pranayam practices. Only a very tiny point of light came through a hole in the ceiling of the cave. After completing this very intense 11-month meditation and pranayam practice in isolation, he emerged with a determination to serve humanity, particularly to bring the teachings of the East to the West, and directed his life toward the unification of science and spirituality. Swamiji began his task by studying Western philosophy and psychology and teaching Eastern philosophy at several Western universities. He received his formal education at Bangalore, Prayag, Varanasi, Darbhanga, and Oxford University, England. He worked as a medical consultant in London and assisted in parapsychological research in Moscow. He then returned to India, where he established a clinic and ashram in Rishikesh. Later, he went to Japan, where he met Yokadasan, the spiritual head of Mahikari, a spiritual organization with a following of several hundred thousand. Yokadasan had had many visions of a sage of the Himalayas. When Swamiji was introduced to him, Yokadasan hugged him with reverence and said, I have been waiting for you. I hope you will give me the secret teachings of the Himalayan masters. Swamiji lived with him for six months and taught various spiritual groups in Tokyo, Osaka, and other cities. In 1969, Swamiji went to the United States at the instruction of his master, Dr. Elmer Green, of the Menninger Foundation of Topeka, Kansas, invited Swamiji to be a consultant in a research project investigating the voluntary control of involuntary states. One of the unusual people we had a chance to study was Swami Rama from Rishikesh, India. We had heard that he could do some unusual things and we asked him to perform. He demonstrated blood flow control in his hand, and then one day he said, tomorrow I'll stop my heart. We objected to this because of the fact that he had said it was a risky thing to do without fasting, and he hadn't been fasting. But he said, no, I want to do it. I've never been wired up before. If I do it, uh, now I'll know what I can do. Uh, when we still objected, he said, I'll sign papers that say the Menninger Foundation is not responsible for my death. Well, the way it worked out, uh, he won the argument. We didn't uh, bother about the papers because he agreed to only stop his heart for 10 seconds. When we wired him up and put him in the lab, we found out that his heart was beating at a normal rate, and suddenly it began beating at five times the normal rate. And when I asked him about this, and I said, you know, your heart didn't really stop the way we thought. I thought it was going to draw a straight line. He said, well, you know, when you stop your heart this way, it still flutters in there. Later on, we took this record to a cardiologist to find out what was really going on. And he said, well, this phenomenon is called atrial flutter. And you know, the heart is just fluttering in there. He used to happen to use the same word that the Swami used. Then the cardiologist said, the blood pressure has dropped. Uh, he has probably fainted. And by the way, what happened to this man anyway? He said, well, nothing. We took off his wires and he went up and gave his lecture. Episodes of this kind uh, were certainly interesting from a physiological point of view, and we decided that we would later go to India and see if we could find some other people like Swami Rama. We joined Swami Rama at his ashram on the banks of the Ganges and tested out the portable laboratory. And then we began testing the unusual control of the body and mind. Under precise scientific conditions, Swamiji demonstrated the ability to stop his heart from pumping blood for 17 seconds and to produce a 10 degree difference in temperature between different parts of the palm of his hand. In one demonstration, using only mental power, he caused a 14 inch aluminum knitting needle 
mounted on a shaft five feet away to spin. He also voluntarily produced and maintained specific brainwave patterns on demand. While producing theta waves, Swamiji appeared to be in a state of deep sleep. However, he was able to accurately recall everything that had transpired in the room during that period. This technique is called Yoga Nidra, a state of conscious sleep, during which you can record everything that is going on around you and recall it later. This earlier by saying you stop your heart. Could you explain that, please? Yes, there are two ways of doing and having control over your involuntary system. Once by one way is by regulating your motion of lungs and then controlling the pumping station that's called heart. Another way is by using your willpower, which comes through one-pointed mindness. That can be done. That's not impossible. That's not difficult. But controlling heart is not the point. It's control of the autonomic nervous system, actually. There are two sets of muscles. One is called voluntary and another is involuntary system. So far, people think that involuntary system is not under our conscious control, but that's not true. Our involuntary system can be controlled, you're saying? Very easily. Including our breathing? Yeah. Can I control my breathing without thinking about it? No. Reports of his work have been documented in the World Book Science Annual 1974 the 1973 Encyclopedia Britannica Yearbook of Science. The Time Life 1973 Nature Science Annual and numerous other publications. Journals and newspapers across the United States reported on the experiments. Swamiji helped to pioneer the use of biofeedback as a therapeutic modality to lay the foundation for stress management and holistic health programs, and to generate interest in the human capacity to experience previously unrecognized levels of consciousness. He was the first yogi to subject himself to modern scientific methods of testing his states of consciousness while at the highest level of meditation. I am a messenger, delivering the wisdom of the Himalayan sages of my tradition. My job is to introduce you to the teacher within. When he asked his Gurudev for advice on his journey to the West, his master replied, To obtain freedom from all fear is the first message of the Himalayan sages. The second message is to be aware of the reality within. Be spontaneous and let yourself become an instrument to teach spirituality without any confusion of religion or culture. All spiritual practices should be verified scientifically, if science has the capacity to do so. Let providence guide you. Atman, the center of consciousness, is not subject to change, death and decay that one should also understand that the mortal part of life is subject to change. And it's the nature that it changes, it constantly changes. Swamiji's deep love for his ancient spiritual tradition was reflected in his life and work. It is a tradition for Indian sages to go to the Himalayas, meditate and live in the caves, lead, lead solitude, uh, quiet life, and it's a long tradition. Those who are real meditators, they can help the world in suffering humanity, even from the caves and quiet corners of the Himalayas, by, you see, praying for them, by sending their thought waves and helping the world. They are powerful people. For nearly 30 years, he lectured throughout the world in monasteries, churches, universities, 
and medical schools. We have become a small family. The whole world is like a small family. But now we should learn how to live together with each other, how to behave with each other, you see. So it's love that will help, actually. But a selfless person alone has capacity to love others. So selflessness is the foundation stone of entire life concept. A firm believer in the value of education, Swamiji provided countless scholarships to needy, deserving students. Swamiji initiated many other charitable works in India and Nepal, including free schools, dispensaries, and a free dispensary for leprosy patients in Kanpur. On October 20, 1991, a devastating earthquake struck the foothills of the Himalayas including the Uttarkashi and Chamoli districts, which were the worst hit regions. Hundreds of people were killed, tens of thousands of homes leveled, and major landslides were triggered. Initially, there was strong government help for the victims. Tragically, however, those efforts were soon stalled by red tape and politics. The death toll continued to rise and hundreds of thousands of people were without food, water, medical care, clothing, or shelter from the bitter cold. Swamiji actively organized the relief effort, knocking on every door possible to ensure adequate relief and rehabilitation for the earthquake victims. As a result of Swamiji's efforts, the central government provided firm support to bring relief to the victims. Swamiji was also the author of many books. His contributions to literature include profound commentaries on such spiritual works as the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, practical guidelines on the application of the ancient wisdom of the East to the fields of psychology and health, a deeply personal collection of prose poetry of his own spiritual experiences, love whispers, and an inspiring account of his experiences with the great teachers who guided his life and spiritual development, living with the Himalayan masters. Dr. Swami Rama, you are the author of several books and some of these are displayed here. And one of your most prominent books has been this one, which you can see on your monitors, Living with the Himalayan Masters. Can we take you back, Dr. Rama, to this experience that you had in the Himalayas. Fortunately, this book was sold 20 lakhs rupees, 13, 14 dollars per book all over the world. Two million copies were sold. Yes, <laughs> and it has given fortune and that. Actually, this is a very inspiration for me to build the hospital. I started because when I started receiving money, I said, what shall I do with this money? Let me do something for my country and let me do something, build a hospital which is helpful for poor people. Swamiji's translations of several of the major spiritual books on Sikhism represent only the beginning of his dedication to the cause of demonstrating the true nature of Sikhism and have won him respect in Sikh and Hindu communities around the world. Equally adept with a brush or pen, his paintings and poetry reflect the divine spark within. To those who understand the message and its words, for them there shall be no fear left on the earth. Therefore, today, with undying gratitude, complete this flower of hearts, its petals and that lotus feet. In addition, he was a highly trained and gifted musician. His book, Indian Music, 
represents one of his efforts to make the Indian system of classical music more easily accessible to the Western world. In 1966, Swamiji established Sadma Mandir Trust Ashram on the banks of the Ganga in the foothills of the Himalayas. Today, the ashram is an international center for the study and practice of meditation. The ashram offers individually tailored programs for students of every level, special meditation retreats and advanced seminars on Swami Ram's teachings are also organized for individuals and groups. In 1970, Swamiji founded the first Himalayan International Institute of Yoga Science and Philosophy in Kanpur, Uttar Pradesh, India. From 1971, in its humble beginnings in a rented house in the Chicago suburb of Barrington, Illinois, the Himalayan Institute has expanded to include branch centers throughout the states, in addition to several international centers in Germany, England, Curacao, Trinidad, Italy, Malaysia, Singapore, and Canada. In 1975, the Himalayan Institute purchased its first property, located in Glenview, Illinois. In 1977, the headquarters was moved to its present location in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. The central headquarters is on a 422-acre campus nestled in the rolling hills of the Pocono Mountains in northeastern Pennsylvania. There, the various educational, therapeutic, publishing, and residential facilities of the Institute are surrounded by spectacular views of wooded hills and valleys. Valen Institute is a holistic health center and uh, students, patients, and visitors come from all over the world to learn, understand about life on all levels, body, breath, sense, mind, and soul. The students understand both Eastern and Western concepts, philosophy, psychology, and medicine. So it's unique of its own kind in the world. Swami Ram was an avid tennis player and a Kung Fu master. He believed that physical health is an essential part of spiritual practice. Dr. Ramey, you are also building this very modern hospital near Dehradun. Tell us about it. That's my dream being naturalized, you see, and I think the dream is fulfilled when it comes into action. And uh, I had a great fire within me to build this great hospital which will serve people, particularly poor people. And, uh, you know, the people of the mountain, of Kumaun and Garhwal region, are very poor. They cannot afford to go to the hospital because hospitals are far away. The largest hospital is the Dehradun, which is only 42 bed hospital. So it's not enough. People die before they reach the hospital. So I want to give them all these facilities and modern amenities so that they don't have to rush to Bombay, Delhi, Chandigarh, and all the problems can be solved at Dehradun. The Himalayan Institute Hospital Trust and Rural Development Institute is located near Dehradun in the Garhwal region of the foothills of the Himalayas and is designed to serve this region's population of millions of people in great medical, economic, and social need. Its mission 
is to develop integrated and cost-effective approaches to healthcare and development for the country as a whole and for underserved populations worldwide. Swamiji started this project in 1989 with an outpatient clinic of only two rooms. Today, it is a 1,200-bedded multi-specialty teaching hospital of Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences. He and his institute are engaged in, apart from the hospital. Well, we have rural development program where we go to the villages, serve poor people, teach them how to live, how to be self-reliant, income generation programs, cleanliness, what education means, what type of education should we have. I do not believe in the education that is being imparted in my country. I feel sorry. You know, this sort of education is not going to help our rising generation. So what actually I want, I want them to learn the basics which are not uh, taught in the schools and universities. Our boys and girls are deprived by that education. How to walk, how to sit, how to talk, how to be straightforward, and how to have perfect control over mind, action, and speech. These basics are which are missing in our educational system. The Rural Development Institute uses a multi-dimensional approach to address locally defined needs and priorities in order to serve the people at large. Special attention is given to the needs of women and children to improve health status, provide opportunities for education, and social development of children and adolescents. Quality of life is enabled through health, water, education, and skill development initiatives. The first batch of MBBS students enrolled in the Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences in 1995. It has since become Swami Rama Himalayan University. Some of the key constituent units of the university include Himalayan Hospital, Cancer Research Institute, Ayurveda Center, and Rural Development Institute. It also has eight schools and colleges, namely the Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences, Himalayan College of Nursing, Himalayan School of Management Studies, Himalayan School of Science and Technology, Himalayan School of Biosciences, Himalayan School of Yoga Science, Himalayan School of Vocational Studies and Skill Development, and Gauri Himalayan School of Science and Technology at Toli, Uttarakhand. On November 13, 1996, Swami Ram took Mahasamadhi at what is now called Swami Ram Center. The center was created to ensure that Swami Ram's words and works continue to be available as a source of inspiration to countless spiritual seekers. The center also continues to publish new books, audios, and videos incorporating Swami Ram's teachings. You know what life is? A camp. And we are in a journey. This is a camp. This is not your home. We are going through this camp. We have to go. We all will have to go. If we have come and we are going, it means we are on journey. This journey should be pleasant. Don't get attached to this world, for the world is not your home. Yes, learn this world as a resting place, and then you have to go ahead. So no harm loving, but a great harm in being attached. There is a difference between attachment and love. Learn to love all and exclude none. That is the way to divine. Peace, peace, peace. God bless you.